Hello, so this is going to be a video all about doomsday weapons. Now, I've done videos in the past talking about certain types of sort of chemical, biological weapons and all things like that, but I thought as a lot of people seem to be interested in this stuff at the moment, it might be worth doing a video talking about, um, you know, all of the kind of different things rolled into one video where people have essentially made things that could have wiped out all life on Earth, or at least all human life on Earth, or a massive chunk of it anyway. Because um, a lot of these things are never guaranteed to be 100%. Now, this video is not intended as scaremongering or anything like that. It's just basically a bit of history of things that have been tried in the past or people might still do. But again, the thing is, I have the attitude with stuff like this. What's the point in worrying about it? You know, if, if there's something so dangerous comes along, it wipes out everything. There's not much, no, no point in worry about that because there's not much you can do about it. So, um... We'll start off with chemical weapons. Now, weirdly, I don't think there is, as much as there's definitely stuff in nuclear and biological, there isn't really any chemical doomsday weapons. Now, I suppose you could say that a really deadly nerve agent, if it was mass-produced in big enough quantities and it was the permanent type, or more... I think it's persistent is the word for it. But it's basically where, with some nerve agents, they eventually evaporate into nothing. And then you get other nerve agents that will basically evaporate and then come back down with the rain. Uh, those are the type which are actually scarier because they stick around for a lot longer. You know, it takes a lot longer for them to be kind of diluted and become useless. Um, so I suppose if you had a factory churning out enough nerve agent and it was just shooting it out a chimney somewhere, and then eventually, you know, it came down with the rains and things, that eventually could wipe out all life on Earth? Potentially? But I imagine it would need to be so, you know, strong to actually, you know, not be diluted by oceans and things like that. But nerve agents are very scary in terms of how easy it is for them to kill people and their lethality, you know, and sort of how little is needed in that sense of, you know, with really strong stuff like VX that you essentially need a couple of MG per person through skin contact to kill them or, you know, make them seriously ill. So nerve agents are certainly scary in that regard, but they were, they were never really optimised to be a doomsday weapon. And as far as I'm aware, there isn't a chemical, you know, I suppose you could maybe say global warming to an extent is a chemical way of um, wiping out all life on Earth. If you believe in all the climate change stuff to the degree we're being told how bad it is, I certainly don't think humans should be fucking up the planet, but I personally don't know if it's going to be as bad as they think. Who knows, and I'll be dead by that point anyway, so it doesn't matter. So there's that one. So... Now let's go on to biological, because that's the thing people are interested in a lot at the moment. And with bioweapons, there was always the idea that humans and people have tried it before would engineer something so deadly that it would basically wipe out all life on Earth. So with pandemics, obviously in the past we have had natural viruses and bacteria that have come along that have killed millions of people. The idea was, of course, with a bioweapon is that basically in a laboratory, different things would be spliced together, so you'd have something of a long incubation period that was very spreadable. Um, but wasn't all that obvious, so you know, people might be able to go two weeks to a month and spread something, not feel anything, and then suddenly die. Um, lots of talk at the moment, is coronavirus a bioweapon? Who the hell knows? It could very easily be something that leaked accidentally from a lab. It's impossible to say, I don't want to really speculate on that, but I know a lot of people have asked me about that. The point is that, you know, it's here and you might want to take precautions about it. I really don't think it's going to wipe out all life on Earth, but you know, it's... It's worth considering, but the idea was with things like chimera viruses, as they were often called, that you would have basically somebody mess about with strains of a virus um, and release it. Most of these projects were actually abandoned just for the sensible reason that a logical person would say, yeah, but if this gets out, won't it kill us as well? And we can't really control it, you can't target somebody with it. And they went, oh yeah, sort of, I guess. The Soviets supposedly abandoned their research on it just because of that reason, that they were too worried that, you know, if this got out, it would kill them as well. Because I think the important thing to realise of a lot of stuff like this is that, you know, once it's out of the box, you can't do much to stop it. Right, we're going to very briefly talk about mutually assured destruction with nuclear war, because that will be one that obviously is very relevant to this. But then I want to talk about something radiological related that's a bit different than the things you normally hear. So, mutually assured destruction, the, every, the idea that every superpower has nukes, and if a big war kicked off, everybody would launch their nukes. America and the Russians certainly have enough nukes, and during the Cold War, America and the Soviets certainly had enough nukes, you know, to end the world several times over. So assuming that the nuclear weapons, you know, are fired and they hit pretty much every mass concentration of people on Earth, and then you have nuclear fallout and, um, you know, potentially a nuclear winter, that would get everybody. But the one I've not really talked about before, and a lot of people would find interesting, is probably the salted cobalt bomb. Now, you could probably have other types of... Um, doomsday radiological weapons like this. 
um, but Cobalt Cobalt 60 is kind of the most obvious choice and you can look up salted cobalt bombs if you're interested. So Cobalt 60 is a radioisotope um, basically that's built in, made in reactors, you would never get it naturally. Um, you know when neutrons interact I assume with Cobalt 59 to become Cobalt 60. And Cobalt 60, to give you some idea of how radioactive it is, its half-life is only five years but mo with most radioactive things the shorter the half-life the kind of stronger they are. Um, so bear in mind, stuff like uranium and thorium, which can still be very radioactive, have half-lives of potentially billions of years, because a lot of that stuff's been around as long as the Earth has, and it's still there, and it's still radioactive. For those of you who don't know, a half-life of radiation means that, let's say you have something that gave off um, 100 counts per second, for example, of radioactivity, and it had a half-life of 10 years. In 10 years' time, it would give off 50 counts. In another 10 years, it would be 25 counts. It doesn't, you know, after the half-life, magically stop, because some people seem to think if it has a half-life, it means after that time it's gone. It just means, no, every that time it's halving each time. You know, so it goes from the original value to a half, so say 1 to 0 0.5 to 0 0.25 to 0. Point, my maths is shit, what, one zero point one two five? You know, but that that's how half-life works. So then you've got the most radioactive thing on Earth naturally, radium-226, that has a half-life of about 1,600 years. Now, radium, let's give you an idea how radioactive radium is. One gram of pure radium, a curie of radium, um, gives off, in rontgens per hour, I think the surface contact amount of rontgens is over a thousand rontgen per hour. If you want to know that in greys, that is 10 grey, I think it is, 10 grey, 10 sieverts per hour. Uh, the point is that an hour's exposure would kill anybody. If, but that's only contact, that's like literally if you had it here and it was pressed against your head, you know, like your fingers are touching like that, that's contact surface. Because of inverse square law, the gamma radiation field from that goes away pretty quickly. Oh, and that's just the gamma from radium. There's alpha and beta emissions as well, but let's just talk about gamma for this. Because gamma's the one you can't really hide from. So, if you've got radium-226, at uh, 18, in 18 inches, a gram of radium-226, one curie, gives off about 4 rontgen per hour. Um, that's about... 3 point something centigrade, um, if you want it in the more modern radiation units. So, that's still a very scary amount, right? 4 onkgen per hour, that's definitely going to give you cancer if you're around it too long. In terms of um, how long it would take to kill you, well, 4 onkgen per hour, uh, 10 hours would be 40 onkgen, 100 hours would be 400 onkgen. That's definitely into quite severe radiation sickness at this point. That would probably kill a lot of people that were exposed to it. So that's the most radioactive naturally occurring thing on Earth. Right, so then you've got things like cesium-137. That has a half-life of about 30 years. Cesium-137 is a lot more radioactive than radium. How much so, I don't really know off the top of my head, but it's more radioactive. Right, and then one of the scariest radioisotopes is a thing called cobalt-60. Now, cobalt-60's half-life is five years, but it is 1,100 times more radioactive per gram than radium-226. I think, roughly, the number might be a bit more, you know, intricate than that, but 1,100, let's say, roughly. So, if you had your uh, bit of radium-226, that, um, you know, at 18 inches, a foot and a half away, that gives you, um, you know, 4 onkgen per hour of gamma radiation in the gamma field. Uh, the, the cobalt-60's uh, level of radioactivity is, what was it, 4,400? It, it's something absurd. So, an hour would kill you four times. Um, 15 minutes is enough to give you a fatal dose, most certainly. Uh, probably a lot less time to get horrible cancers and, you know, stuff from that. So, the point is that one gram of cobalt, um, even if you're not directly next to it, if it, if you're, you know, a foot away from it or something, or a few metres away, it would still kill you within an hour of you being around it, even though you can't smell it, taste it, see it. That cobalt is shooting gamma rays through you with quite high energy, frying your cells. Um, so, the idea of the salted cobalt bomb, and this is discussed in Doctor Strangelove, um, you know, when he says, Cobalt Thorium G? Even though that's not a real thing, but, um, so, salted cobalt bombs, the point was, is, um, that you would basically design weapons to just release a massive amount of cobalt, um, cobalt-60. The idea was basically to have a bomb that, I guess, had a massive filler of cobalt in it, and a neutron sort of, you know, reaction where the cobalt becomes irradiated, the cobalt-59 becomes cobalt-60 and is dispersed over a massive area. Now, I think scientists were working out how many tons of cobalt-60 you would need to kill all life on Earth, but the point was, if cobalt-60 was evenly distributed enough on Earth, everything is going to die. 
just because there would be so many crossing gamma fields, all of massively strong intensities, that you couldn't hide, you couldn't take cover, you know, you would be dead. So, yeah, Salted Cobalt is really interesting. I don't know how much of Chernobyl's actual um, fallout was um, Cobalt, but that'd be very interesting to know. But what's very interesting, though, is if you see videos where people with good decimeters, not things like, um, you know, a SOX O1M or a... Um, Gamma Scout, but you know, things like a Terra P or like modern military ones which can go up to very high radiation ranges fairly accurately and tell you what you're looking at. When people like that go into the Pripyat basement, you know, like 30 plus years on from um, the Chernobyl disaster, you're still seeing levels down there in places of um, 800 to 900 millisieverts per hour. And that's 30 years on, so it means things like Strontium 90 and Cesium 137 have had at least one full half life. Um, Cobalt-60, if there was any down there, which I imagine there would have been, would be quite a few half-lives, so that's massively weaker than it was at the time. So bear in mind, 800 to 900 millisieverts, you're getting pretty close at that point to one sievert per hour in places, um, in the basement. And that's just from the firefighters' clothing, this isn't the corium, you know, like the elephant's foot under the stuff, this isn't places that are really contaminated in number four plant, the fireman's clothing and the stuff that was dumped in the basement for containment measures, uh, some of that is still giving off probably something like 70 to 100 Rongen per hour. So what that means in raw numbers is if you're down there for an hour you would start getting radiation sickness a few hours down there and you're dead. Um, so yeah, that's um, some doomsday weapons for you. Thankfully, as I said, none of these have ever happened yet, as far as we're aware. Um, and yeah, if it does happen, why worry about it? Because you're going to die and there's nothing you can do about it. So that, that's, that's my optimistic way of looking at it anyway. But yeah, if you ever wanted to know about some of the crazy sort of things humans have fought up to kill each other. See, nuclear warfare I can understand because it's just if once you understand that a weapon that powerful exists, you have to have it because you can't not have it and let an enemy nation have it. That makes perfect sense. And it was because of mutually assured destruction that the Cold War never went into World War Three because everybody was so worried about basically a nuclear exchange wiping each other out um, that, you know, it never happened. But with stuff like assaulted cobalt bomb, hmm, you know, biological warfare, hmm, you know, that, that's where it gets really scary and quite sketchy. But there you go.